<laughs> yes. Hey, hey, man. He's walking with me. <laughs> you know, every so often you meet someone who's making a real difference. In Thailand, a guy called Edwin Weck is famous and sometimes infamous for his work to save and rehabilitate wildlife that seemingly have no hope. At his rescue centre, he looks after more than 400 different animals. And I know they're always in need of volunteers. So that's where I'm heading now. To see if I can lend a hand. Chris has travelled 125 kilometres south of Bangkok to help out the Wildlife Friends Foundation. It's run by Dutch-born Edwin Wick and his team of dedicated volunteers. Hello. Oh, wow. Hi, how, are how are you, Edwin? It's Hi, great guys. to see oh, you, yeah. buddy. Good to see you again. Hello, Hi, Noi. Noi. How are you? <laughs> Look at you. Hello to Chris. You know, I associate you with monkeys, but normally not quite as cute as this. Yeah. No, uh, these are actually leaf monkeys. Yeah. It's not like the little buggers that we saw last time. Not as naughty. <laughs> not as naughty. <laughs> I first met Edwin last year when I travelled to a town called Lot Barry, which has been totally overrun with monkeys. Oh! That's your guy! Now, they came in from the forest, lured in by the promise of food offerings from the local temple, but now there are so many, they can't possibly all find food. They'd struggle without this sort of feeding, wouldn't they? They wouldn't be able to survive without handouts. Yeah. It's a hell of a handout, too. <laughs> It really impressed me and it made me interested to see what other work Edwin does. That's part of the reason I wanted to come back. And I would have driven in further, but you had a fairly large roadblock there. Yeah. <laughs> this is uh, one of the rescued elephants called Boon Mi, rescued from the streets of Thailand, basically a begging elephant. She's about 60 years old and she's retired. And the only thing she does is eat, sleep and poo. Well, I'm here to work, mate. Your vet skills should be... Uh, coming in handy with, uh, with girls like this. Yeah. But I think we should first have a tour. Edwin founded the Wildlife Rescue Centre in 2001. It's a sanctuary for hundreds of animals, which are the victims of maltreatment or neglect. Somehow I like to believe that once the animals arrive at the rescue centre, they got another chance at life. In most cases, we are able to do that. So that's, that's a good feeling. The difference we make on the whole scale of things, this huge illegal wildlife trade, what we do is a little drop. But for the animals that we've rescued, it was a world of a difference. Hello. This isn't a zoo for the public to visit, but it does open its doors to volunteers from around the world. Now, I was only meant to stay six weeks and I've stayed 11. It just opens your eyes to how much damage humans have caused, but also how much good you can do in return. This is actually something I'd like to show you. This is the Gibbon Rehab Forest. Yeah. And over here we hold gibbons that um, we've rescued over the years and are being made ready to go back to the wild. Hi. 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 What's with the noise? Covering up doesn't make it better. This girl produces these volumes not just with a voice, but using this massive air sac she inflates almost like her own personal amplifier. It's very effective. The call actually between a male and a female is a, is a huge difference. You could hear it from miles away, whether it's male or female. You realise uh, later on when you walk around here that this was a female, very long whoop, 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 And the male is much shorter. It's called, it goes like whoop, 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 whoop. Uh, we have approximately 90 gibbons here, almost 100%. Expats kept the people's houses and fed the wrong kind of food. Lots of sweets, some of them even drink cola, some of them eat candy. So they have medical issues, uh, diabetes. They got cataracts, eye problems, overweight. They're just not very healthy. So people just can't look after them 
they get sick, they realise they're too much work and then they hand them into you. One of the most common reasons for handing them over is they become aggressive, we can't hold them any longer. Yeah. Second thing is my neighbours are complaining about the noise, they sing pretty loud as you have found out. You see he's giving you your hand, he, uh, he, wants to, he wants to hold you. They don't know that they're gibbons, they think that they're like furry people. He's obviously an incredibly beautiful little guy. But, you know, if he has any fault, it's probably he's too trusting. He just wants to be held and wants to, to feel like he's got some sort of company there. The most time we spend on rehabilitating Gibbons is re-socialising. Make him able to communicate and live together with other Gibbons. And then how to behave in the forest before they go back. It's a bit of a, a given school. There are more than 400 animals here, and just as many stories of heartbreak and neglect. Hi, Cha Cha! Hi! Her name is Cha Cha. She was actually tied to a little chain in a bar to entertain customers. Really? And we took her away. It's about uh, a year and a half ago. Yeah. There's a lot of smiling going on. Yeah, that's not really smiling. He is actually um, basically saying, like, if I could get you, I would bite you. Oh. Just get your hands nice and close. Edwin, Edwin. Hi, Louise. The rescue team uh, have been out and caught a large snake. Uh, they're on their way back to the hospital now. Well, they said it was big, but, you know, I don't know. If it's a cobra, uh, three meter, three and a half meter, it's, uh, it's quite big. But if it's a python, it could be up to five meters. As far as the first challenge goes here, this is a pretty good one. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, it's big. This snake is not going to be easy. It's a, it's a reticulated python, right? Yep. I was hoping for a Burmese python because oh, they're easier to handle. Yeah, no, so these ones I. are <laughs> These ones are very tough. I was hoping for something a little smaller. Yeah. yeah. It's pretty heavy. That's really heavy. There we are. Hi, Louise. Wow. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> How are you going? Oh, my God. Scottish-born Louise has been working at the foundation for 12 months. When that thing came in, I just thought, do we even have to take it out of the cage? Can't we just look at it from the outside? So you weren't exactly brought up catching these? Uh, no. But I'm sure you can teach me the ways. <laughs> <laughs> so we obviously don't know how he was caught doing and whether no. he might have injuries. No, exactly. So we need to really check him out before we know we can let him go or we have, he needs treatment. All we know is that this snake appeared in someone's house. Now, they were going to kill him, yet someone stepped in and said, hey, don't kill him. But we don't know exactly how many injuries he's incurred while he's been caught. Shall I open it Yeah, if we can slide okay. that open. I'll just slide it open. <clears throat> the only way to know what is actually going on with him is to get him out of this cage, stretch him right out and have a good look. That's not going to be easy. OK. The worry with reticulated pythons comes from two fronts. Stretch him out. First of all, they bite. They do actually have quite big teeth. But secondly, it's the fact the moment you threaten them, they will coil around you and tighten. And this isn't a small snake. About three and a half, four metres. OK, so I can just get you to keep a hand there. The python is covered in ticks, but Chris is concerned about a more serious issue. His skin isn't exactly springing back. It's just retaining its shape when I lift it up, so he is quite dehydrated, so we're probably going to need to give him a bit of a hand there as well. Fluids will help the python recover, and then hopefully it can be returned to the wild. I can totally understand the people that found this python wanting to get rid of it. The thought of it in my house freaks me out, but thankfully, instead of killing it, they called Edwin. OK, first job. You didn't do that bad. You can stay. But you know, I'm going to leave. <laughs> exactly. You're a very kind man. Yeah, I know, I know. <laughs> so we're going to see one bear now, uh, Pepsi. Yep. She's a bear rescued about eight years ago, and she needs to get a dental uh, treatment, probably, first of the check her out. 
It's Chris's second day at the Wildlife Centre and his next challenge is to treat an aggressive sun bear that's in pain. Pepsi has developed a lot of tartar inside a mouth, on the teeth. There's concern they're sore, so my job today is to check them out. Give us a smile. Oh, good girl. Good girl. This is the bear they're talking about. Not so close. <laughs> she can reach through there. Oh. Pepsi was uh, rescued from a temple and looked after by monks, and as is often the case, has a terrible diet before she came here. The fact she had a poor diet meant that her teeth just never really have been in good shape. Since she's come in here, she's had a long history of dental problems, and today we're determined to make sure there's no serious issues in there. Every now and then, I do just get a little glimpse of those, those discoloured teeth. Just the brown coating, the lower canine looks quite dark as mm -hmm. well. And we want to catch it before it turns into full abscess and then the bear can't eat. But there's obviously got to be a fair bit of care here because she can really turn. Yeah, no one goes to that side of the bars. <laughs> Ever. <laughs> the only way we're going to be able to do this is by darting her and then under anaesthetic having a closer look. You a good shot? I'm OK. Good. I know I'm going to have to be better than OK right now, but yeah. <laughs> I'm OK. Oh. If you miss once, then they become really difficult. So first shot. One shot. One shot. OK, it's having a look in. And yeah, she's full in. As I'm lining up the shot, Louise's words are echoing in my mind. One shot. It has to be one shot. So I take my time. And at just the moment where she turns around, I go. It looked like it had solid contact and stayed in there for a few seconds, so it should have injected into the muscle. There we go. Yep. Okay. Good. Nice shot. So how do we know she's fully asleep here? Can we prod her or...? Uh, we'll use the high-tech banana test. Banana test. Banana test. We're going to just gently throw a banana at her from outside the cage. They teach you this at university in yep, Scotland, or yep. was, was this a new thing here? Yeah, there's a, there's a full uh, course on the banana test. That is at her, and if she flinches, then she's obviously. Then still she's not sleepy enough. Not sleepy enough. It's quite ridiculous <laughs> throwing bananas well, at a, a an asleep test. bear. Then we try the broom test. It's a two-stage test. Yeah, sure. I already feel stupid enough throwing bananas at a bear that, that's asleep. I know, we made that up just for you. <laughs> OK, good. Okay. Pass. So she's out, right? She's out, good. So we will give her a quick check with a stethoscope. We'll get our team to come down and we can load her onto the sidecar and take her straight to the hospital. OK, there's a bit of a reflex there, but she's certainly looking deep enough to make this journey now. Whereas you know what to expect with a dog or a cat, the thing about a bear is they're not anaesthetised every day, so we don't really have the data, we don't really know the dosages and how long they stay under four, so we're flying pretty blind right now. All right, so do you want me to ride up with her? Yep. It looks like the anaesthetic is taking effect, but if she does wake up, she'd knock me down with her heavy hands and then slice and dice me with those massive claws of hers. Not ideal all round, really. The sidecar is the perfect form of animal transportation. It delivers Pepsi straight to the door of the vet clinic. I'll have to get one of those from Bondi. Pepsi was rescued from a temple. A poor diet has taken its toll. You can see now that she's asleep, really thick layers of tartar over these canine teeth here and also some of these incisors. So the hope is, once we can scale that away, there should be a healthy tooth underneath. We hope. Even though Pepsi is asleep, it doesn't mean we have all the time in the world. We've got to work to a really strict time schedule here because she cannot stay under anaesthetic for too long. It's the sound that sends shivers down everyone's spine. 
Egg Fleet Pepsi isn't awake to hear it. Do we need to do any extractions? Some of these front incisors aren't looking great. It's actually one that's a little bit loose there. The fact is, if we can avoid having to extract any teeth, then we will. But looking at this little incisor here, it's loose. And anyone that's had a loose tooth knows that it wobbles around and it's quite painful, so it is going to have to go. Of all the teeth to remove on a bear, though, this is the one you want to take out. It's the smallest tooth <laughs> out of the whole set. All right, that side's done. Let's spin up. Despite the challenges of her being a sun bear, having massive teeth, being potentially aggressive, having massive claws, it's all gone pretty much to plan. Now that she's all done, we're going to get her back down to her enclosure, in the sidecar, of course, so she can wake up and be greeted by her best friend, Cola. That's right, Pepsi and Cola. I didn't make that up. Looks good. Yeah, we should get out. Yeah, all right. <laughs> Don't have to ask me twice. <laughs> Two hours later, Pepsi has made a full recovery and is reunited with Cola. And Chris is back at the clinic learning about another special little orphan. Wow. Come here. Oh. Hey. Duncan was bought in a market for 800 baht. Like so many of these uh, cute looking animals, I mean, you can see by her face why people would want to have her as a pet. Why is she, why is she funny with me? She's a bit scared of men. She, like a lot of the babies that we get, she's, um, her mum was being poached from the wild to sell a baby in a market as a pet. Okay. And I mean, they're so cute, you can tell why people want them, but. So men might have done that? Uh, yeah, I think so. And, oy, 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 okay. When you see these little faces, you can understand why people fall under their spell, why they would pay some money to have a photo or to have a hold. But this is the problem, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> oh, don't go. This scary man. It's already over for her. She's got a lifetime in captivity now because she can never be released. She's never grown up in the wild. Thankfully, she, once she's been hand reared in a few more months, she can go and join our langers in a big enclosure. I mean, it's nothing obviously compared to what she would have in the wild. And that's what we're, we're trying to get across, you know, to try and not support animals exploited in tourism or in the pet trade. Although it's really cute to see her running about. We don't want her here. We want her where she's supposed to be. Oh, yeah. Good girl. We currently keep around 400 animals here at the rescue center. That sounds like a lot. It is a lot. The worst thing actually of that is that 80% of those animals will never go back to the wild. There's no suitable place, or the animals aren't physically or mentally capable of surviving in the wild. So. That's a, that's a tough one. That's really uh, a tough thing to see. Making a difference is always difficult. You're fighting against people that make a lot of money out of illegal wildlife trade, exploitation of wildlife in tourism industry. You have a lot of enemies. Hey, hi, yeah, yeah, yeah. I think hi. Gandhi said once that when you want to change the world, people will laugh at you. When you start changing the world, people will fight you. And eventually, they see you're making a difference, they'll join you. It's all gone. All gone. Hi, Chris. Chris, I got a, a call. Just a, a monkey has actually entered the school yeah. and is uh, trying to attack or scaring the children. Yeah. So we gotta go. We gotta probably move that monkey out of that school. Okay. Yeah, yeah, sure. Let's sure. Go. No worries. Edwin and his team are on call around the clock to help rescue animals in trouble. Okay, we're all set. It's done. Gun ready, medical supplies ready. Do we know the condition of the monkey now? He's probably hungry. It's dry season. He's also lonely. He wants to find a group and uh, yeah, somehow he got lost, I think. Yeah. Okay, here it is. That's the school. Yeah. The kindergarten and the temple. We'll park the cars down here. Chris and Edwin have been called out to capture a rogue monkey threatening children at a local school. OK. So do we know where it is in here? Uh, they said it's somewhere behind here. 
This is not normal. They've never seen a monkey around here. They said it's the first time, and um, this has been pretty aggressive. Next to the school and the little kindergarten over here, he can do some real damage. Uh, eventually, he's going to come down again, but I'd like to get him down our way. The locals are saying they've seen it on the roof, nah. <laughs> but just look in the roof now, there's no sign, so Edwin's just trying to work out where it could be, but it's so fast and so elusive that... Uh, he seems to be, to be on challenge. the other side, near the temple. He's on the roof. The worry is, if we can't catch him today, then some of the locals may have a go themselves. And that may not be kind, it may not be as gentle as we're hoping this is going to be. A scene through here. So just where one of the, the roofs comes down at an angle, he's just perched in there and he's found a little ledge and a little, almost looks like a window he's poking his head through. So is, is he inside the temple there? Actually inside the window? Yes. If he goes in around the temple, are there any rules around? No, we just have to take our shoes off, that's all. But we can still shoot him. We in. can still shoot him in the temple, as long as you do it with your shoes off. <laughs> Let's go. You see him? It looks like he's around the corner there. He's a big boy? Yeah. Got him. He's very elusive. He's very quick. There's buildings, there's rooftops, there's branches. I have only a split second to point the gun and to actually pull the trigger. You might think that maybe it's time for me to have a shot. Edwin is a former Special Forces soldier. This is a time where I'm quite happy to stand back and let him, him take it. Well, I still have to get the right shot, though. <laughs> the first one, I hit him in the, in the, in the hip, yeah. which was good, but it got out very quickly. You need about three, four, five seconds for all the anesthesia to go. You can see he's a bit wobbly, mm. but not wobbly enough to catch him yet. The second shot I missed. He feels pretty safe up there, and we can hardly get up there. I can't walk on that roof. The roof tiles are just too thin. Edwin needs a change of tactics, so locals bring in a crane. Dog, you one. Don't cap. So he's climbed onto this roof now, which is it's actually a crematorium. He's hiding just in this ledge behind this big brick chimney here. Hot for dawn. He's off again. I just can't get the shot. Sorry, you know. This monkey's amazing. I mean, you know they're intelligent, you know they're agile, you know they're fast, and he's just proving to be every single one of those things. Huh? On the other side again? It's too high on that roof. I can't, I don't have a shot. Yeah. With so many children around, locals want to see the monkey caught and removed as soon as possible. You think he's going to stay on the roof? Yeah, it's so many people around, and I can't control the people around us. That's the problem. I got 20 people walking around. They're all running, <laughs> shouting, laughing. <laughs> Not ideal. I think I'm more stressed than the monkey is. Suddenly, the monkey makes a break for it. Now Edwin can get a clear shot. Got him! Wow! Good, good shot, mate. That was a very good shot. OK, Ling, uh, the monkey is down from the injection, so I just got to get the youngest, uh, the smallest guys to come. Even though he's now gone to sleep, the problem is that he's now asleep on the roof. The roof tiles are too fragile for anyone like me or Edwin to go out there and actually go and pick him up. So we're now trying to work out a way to get this monkey off the roof. There we go. There he is. Come on, boy. In this situation, Edwin could have very easily just given up quite early, but it's in these times where you realise that he does this for the love of it. He's really persistent, really committed to making sure this monkey and all the other animals get the best possible home they can. 
Look at these teeth. They can do some real damage to a child. His heart rate is incredibly high, so it's, it's a measure of, I guess, the, the stress that he's gone through over the last little while, but also the fact that he's, he's not completely under anaesthetic. He's really getting stronger and stronger. If you get the other arm to the back... The monkey needs to be taken back to the rescue centre for observation before it can be released. I think people think it's really interesting to see the monkey finally being caught. They want the monkey out of here, uh, but they also want the monkey out in a nice way. That's why you saw that even the local municipality brought that, that crane. People want to get it done properly. People want to go home and say, well, end of the story is a good story. And uh, yeah, that makes me happy, actually, to see that. That means we're not just only us, a bunch of crazy animal lovers, you know, that want to do something good, but we actually feel, and we're talking to the kids and the adults around here, the teachers, that they all feel that this is important, that it's done properly, so it makes you feel good. We've got uh, one elephant called Buangun. She's an old lady. She needs some, uh, some treatment for her abscesses. She's got half a dozen abscesses over her body, and uh, maybe you could help and check on her and help to clean it out. All glamorous jobs, right? Yep, only, only, only for you, special jobs. <laughs> I've done plenty of abscesses in dogs and cats, but I get the feeling with an elephant, it might be entirely different. At the Wildlife Friends Foundation in Thailand, Chris is helping out the boss, Edwin Week. That's an abscess there. Yeah, that's one of the abscesses that needs treatment. Nine rescue elephants are now permanent residents at the centre, and most have chronic, long-term health issues. She's been used heavily in the tourism industry and before that in the logging industry. So she has had these abscesses probably years before she was rescued. She had about triple amount of abscesses when she was brought in, but. The treatment has been taken over two years now. Mm. So it's a matter of cleaning really well every other day. That's why I'm here. To treat a girl this size, it's going to take a team effort. So we got some volunteers, two girls from Australia, one from Canada, and they're oh, going to help you. Hello, how are you going? Hello, good So you guys can help, band together, a bit of Aussie spirit, and triumph over the Dutchman here. <laughs> that time. <laughs> These abscesses are huge. I mean, they, they make grapefruits look small. You can feel the, the pus inside them too. So it's important we, we get as much pus out of those as we can. Thailand has about 2,200 elephants in the wild and approximately 2,500 in captivity. The problem is that captive elephants are placed under the livestock law, so they can be bought and sold just like a cow, a horse, or a buffalo but we have no animal welfare laws. So the treatment of elephants in captivity is hard to control. And that's one of our biggest problems. So you got a favorite in there? Amongst the um, corn and the pineapple? She really likes the corn. Yeah? Yeah. Elephants are being exploited, working long hours, uh, going through heavy training sessions with a lot of cruelty. I think that's one of the biggest problems we really have when it comes to animal welfare. It's not only the local tourism industry now demanding for these elephants, even China as a growing nation now wants these elephants. And you know, when there's a demand and there's a lack of enforcement, that's gonna be illegal training. That is deep. Mm, yeah, huge. The really hard thing to accept about all these abscesses is that they all arise from the same cause. This hard life these elephants have had to lead. Oh, there we go. The worry with Boer is, given her history in logging and in tourism, that perhaps Mahouts may have hit her with sticks. Those little sticks break the skin, bacteria get underneath the skin, and from there, set up infections. Now we've got it clean. The plan is to try to get as much of this antibiotic cream up there as we can. And then, with any luck, this might just stay in there. Just make sure that that environment in there, which is now sterile, stays as close to that as possible. All right, next one. 
There we go. Here's the leg. It's almost like she knows I'm out there somewhere and <laughs> just isn't quite sure where, so just starts kicking in all directions. While this is an uncomfortable thing for Bill to go through, it's just such a small part of a day. The rest of a day is filled up with play, filled up with food, and filled up with love. And it's miles away from her old life. I think after we've had a bath together and I've tended to your wounds, we, we now know each other <laughs> quite well. So it only makes sense that I'd feed you as well, yeah? This is a good spot. Yeah. Chris and Edwin are about to release a wild monkey which was terrorising children at a local school. There we are. It's a bit calmer than the schoolyard. You see how wild he gets? Yeah. I think he realises that he's somewhere he should be. So there'll be a few monkeys around here, but not too many. Yeah, he might have some old friends here or some old enemies, we don't know. He can smell the mountain, he can smell his natural habitat. He just wants to get out there. Go this way. Yep. So just looking for a shady spot close to that, yeah. that hill there. I'm actually quite worried he's going to go after us. So I think it's better to actually put the cage on the side, unlock it, walk a few metres back, and let it go. OK, let's do I mean, this. Here are the monkeys. We've got to hurry. All right. OK, let's do this. There he goes. That was easy. After all the build-up, <laughs> it was a bit of a disappointment, really. Just opened the cage door and he just decided this case is closed. He was gone. You're going slow for a change. We're in a forest area and um, it wouldn't surprise me if we uh, encounter some heavy traffic. After releasing the rogue monkey, Chris and Edwin are heading back to the rescue centre. As we're driving along, Edwin's going quite slow and has this smirk on his face. I know something's up. Look, there's an elephant here, yeah. right next to the village. All of a sudden, I see exactly why Edwin's on the go slow. A big male elephant up here, just on the side of the road. Yeah, and you've got to realise that this is not one of the elephants at our rescue centre. This yeah. is a wild one. Yeah. I mean, he could pick this car up if he wants to he and could, push it over to the he side. Could, he could do anything he likes. There was another one just behind there in the bushes as well. Incredible to see them this close when they're wild. I mean, you, you're used to seeing elephants in zoos and appreciating their size and their, their majesty, but when he's here and now just turning, just have a look here, that would be a freak out. There's more there. Yeah. Look at him, how he impressive kind of walking and I guess this is really what it's all about for you, though, Edward, isn't it? Yeah. It's actually seeing the animals in the wild and rescuing them is great, but to see them not needing rescuing is <laughs> must be even more special. Yeah, it is great. It's great to see them in the wild. It's a pity that they're along the road. In Thailand, Chris and wildlife warrior Edwin Week have encountered a daily problem. There's a road going right through the forest. It's actually quite a busy road. And people are throwing food out of the cars feeding the elephants over there. This has changed behaviour of the elephants. The elephants are actually waiting for food now, instead of foraging themselves. Look at her, she's in protection mode. The tail up, see the tail being higher up, and, and then when she looked at us, the ears wide open like that. This kind of roadblock is not easy to be ignored by people, even with a large car. These elephants can stop you, and they can do a lot of damage to your car, your property, or if you're on a motorbike, to you. Motorcycle riders can just get swiped off their bikes. Only a few weeks ago, a monk was killed when he went out to try to feed one of the elephants. It's dangerous. You don't know that he might not even want to kill somebody. They don't know their own strength. And, you know, that's one of the problems we face here with these elephants, and they get so close to people so often, they lose respect. Yeah. Thousands of people pass through this road every day, up and down. And that's one of the problems. You see, here, they're starting some kind of fencing to stop the elephants coming out of the jungle. Yeah. But it ain't gonna stop them. Yeah. Without electrical fencing, that ain't gonna work. The elephant is such a strong symbol of Thailand, yet 
the reality of the elephant's plight here is anything but strong. There are only 2,200 left in the wild. And those, as we've seen here, are pretty vulnerable. Every day in Thailand, it's an ongoing struggle to get the right balance between people and animals. Edwin's passion is finding that balance. I think a very important message is that we should not exploit wildlife. Come on. Whether it's for tourism, in a zoo, a circus, wildlife needs to be in the wild. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you know we go breaking that in half? <laughs> I want it to be possible to close down this place, that we're not needed no. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> no, no. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, that's not going to happen. There will always be a need for wildlife rescue centers like ours. Second best would be to grow in size, give the animals more space and a better life than they already got. The rescue centre here survives entirely on donations. They get food from some of the local farmers in return for care of their animals. But financially, a lot of the donations come from Australia and from other countries all around the world. In you go, start scrubbing. What's this? Get in and you'll find out. Are you serious? Yeah. <laughs> I thought this was the, like, the quiet time. For Just the elephants, relax. sure, yeah. Volunteers work is never done. While the money makes a huge difference, there's nothing that can replace the care the time, the love shown by the volunteers that work here. I actually just wanted to see me this shirt off. It's, it's always great to have a vet uh, extra, you know? It's like tools. You can't have enough of them. For that, it's been uh, a great week. Can you feel that? Hmm? I really need all the help I can get. Any vet, vet nurse, whatever. We, we need people to help all these animals. Oh, you're a good girl. The first couple of years when I did this work, I would go on a rescue and see an elephant badly treated or see a monkey in a very tiny cage, and I used to get furious with the owners. There you go. I realized after a couple of years that that approach doesn't really work. If I want people to support our work, I need to make sure they understand what's wrong and what they've done wrong without making them feel guilty. That's amazing. Yes, I still get angry, but I won't show it. I'm determined to help the animal, and I always tell myself and the animal in, in question that this is the day everything is going to change. Everything that happened is over, and from now on, things are only going to get better. I really think what being here has taught me is the fact that when you travel to a place like Thailand, you have to do it with open eyes and be aware of what you're seeing. That photo on the street with that amazing animal or that elephant ride, sometimes it comes at a cost and it's not just financial. Hey, I was just coming to say goodbye, but I think you're about to beat me to it. Yeah, I'm afraid we gotta go too. There's another rescue coming in. Okay. Well, mate, I just want to say thank you. Thanks for coming by. It's thank you incredible. for being here, helping out, and please spread the word. I will. I'll do that for sure. I mean, look, you've opened my eyes to what you're battling here, but also I think my eyes have been open to, to the challenges. It's yeah. been incredible. So thank you, thank you, Noi. Thank you, you're welcome. Thank you for coming and, and visit us. I'll see you later. Little... My baby's still Sam, so... Hmm. I tried. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, guys. See you later. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. No worries. Bye. Hi, I'm Dr. Danny Dusek from Bondi Vet. If you love our show and want to see more, plus some amazing content about pets and how to care for them, hit the subscribe button. Click that little notification bell and we'll see you on our next video.